recognizing the House Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak uh, to Bill 23, the Motor Vehicle uh, Amendment Act. And as uh, both of my colleagues, the, the Minister of Transportation and also uh, the official opposition's uh, critic, have noted um, that this bill uh, is uh, an important bill, especially for anybody who's not uh, in a motor vehicle. And I think um, the way that our laws in this province have evolved over the years uh, is very much, I think, reflective of the car-centric society uh, that we have. And uh, I can't uh, stand and speak to this bill without recognizing uh, a constituent of mine on Salt Spring Island, uh, Mina Lee Johnson. Every time I go to Salt Spring, Mina Lee reminds me of our car-centric society. She reminds me of the noise that's generated by cars. She reminds me of the pollution that's generated by cars. She reminds me of the dangers that motor vehicles pose to anybody who's not uh, in a motor vehicle. And if we just take a look at the name of this act as a very basic start, the Motor Vehicle Act, the Motor Vehicle Amendment Act, we're amending the Motor Vehicle Act. This is not an act that's generally designed for the safe transportation uh, in all the different modes. This is about protecting and enhancing the use of motor vehicles. And so, you know, I, I think it's just a, it's a, a minor point with major impact, I think. If what we are designing the rules of our passenger right-of-ways or our, our transportation right-of-ways around is just the motor vehicle, then um, the outcomes will be that that will be the, the center of the decision-making. I think now as we're looking at uh, active transportation uh, options that are increasingly uh, prominent in our communities, that perhaps it might be time for us to change the name of the Act, to change what the Act is built around, and, and that would just be the transportation through a variety of different modes. A lot of the time that we, t a lot of the anxiety that's created in communities when a municipality moves to build bike lanes, for an example, on roads, is that that space is for cars, not spaces for cyclists. Those are the, that, that, that space that's now being taken up and made just for cyclists previously was made just for cars. And so uh, I, I've, I've had a number of conversations where people get quite anxious and quite frustrated about that. And you know, um, the, the reality of it is, is that as someone who is a cyclist uh, and, and, and chooses to, to get to work uh, here, on, mostly on the nicest days, uh, by, uh, by bike, um, and even by bus uh, when I, I'm not on my bike, uh, the reality is, is that uh, oftentimes those motor vehicles, the often the single family, sing, their single occupant vehicles, are um, uh, the preference is given uh, to that form of transportation rather than uh, creating space for buses, creating spaces for rapid buses, creating spaces for cyclists uh, and pedestrians. So um, having that on the record and recognizing the important advocacy that uh, Mina Lee uh, offers every time I go to Salt Spring, uh, I want her to know and I want uh, all of my constituents, and indeed anybody who's paying attention to this, to know that uh, these are important changes in this bill. But there is also a, a philosophical discussion that needs to happen in this province that um, if we continue to build uh, our legislation around a, a single form of transportation, um, then those are the outcomes that we're going to get. But today, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, debating, as my uh, colleague in the official opposition from uh, Surrey White Rock and the Minister of Transportation, been talking about uh, safe passing laws for cyclists, uh, enabling innovation like speed limiters on heavy duty vehicles to help reduce collisions and uh, improve uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and to expand the province's ability to permit technology like robot uh, delivery services. Um, and as the Minister of Transportation noted in his speech, this is a bill that has had a lot of support 
from um, third party stakeholders, people from and groups outside this legislature in acknowledging these important changes. As someone who uh, cycles to work, uh, cycles down to the legislature, I'm one of the seven MLAs that has the benefit of living and working in the city. Um, uh, most of my ride is on an old uh, rail bed, uh, now a trail off the road. But there is a couple of spots uh, on my commute where I am directly exposed to, to vehicles. And, um, you know, as much as a, a cyclist can create as big a presence as they can on their bike and using, using bright colors and a lot of light, uh, the reality of it is, is that there is always a sense that the cyclist is an imposition on this road right of way. And I think that that's part of the psychology that needs to change and is changing by requiring drivers to share the road and to create a substantive amount of space in passing cyclists, in not trying to rush to get past the cyclist before the oncoming vehicle gets there and creating a, a really dangerous situation uh, for the person on the bike. And um, I, I've, I've had a few of those incidents, but the incidents that I've had uh, are scary. And, you know, I think that the decision for me to uh, divest of a vehicle and to move to a bicycle and to kind of commit, uh, I guess, a portion of my um, commute on, on bike is that every day that I get on that bike, I want to get home and see my family. And so, you know, I guess just for the, for the drivers out there, and as someone who also drives a vehicle, I often have to remind myself because it's not difficult to get in to the driver's mindset when you're behind the wheel of a vehicle and to kind of lose all of that memory of the close calls on a bicycle. So uh, I'm very pleased that this is an uh, initiative that is underway in creating a one meter between vehicles and cyclists and a minimum of uh, three meters of uh, distance following. Uh, I think the next important thing that will come after this law is passed, of course, is the education of drivers, that this is indeed the new law. Many of us get our driver's license and then that's the last time that we really think about, I mean, we know the rules, we follow the rules, but we, we don't ever have to go through a process to be reminded of what the rules are, to brush up, to, to have those, those constant you know, touch-ins throughout our driving career. You know, and when we're making changes to the rules of the road, how the government informs the public that this is their new responsibility, a meter of distance in passing, three meters of distance behind in, in following, making sure that the public knows of that will be uh, very important. It's um, also just to say that uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, with respect to um, this new change, we are joining a, a large number of uh, legislative jurisdictions across North America that are making these changes and making the roads uh, more safe for cyclists. 39 provinces and states have passed uh, a similar law, including New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Ontario, uh, and Quebec. I think it's important just to put into context that 1,600 British Columbians um, on bicycles are injured in car crashes uh, each year. And almost 80% of people say close passing vehicles are their biggest threat while cycling. And those who bike regularly say that they uh, are close pass at least once a week. Uh, that's slightly more than what my experience is, but certainly uh, only one uh, accident, uh, just one incident uh, could be a, a life changing experience for a cyclist. Uh, the speed limiters on trucks, uh, some good questions being asked by the, by the, the member of the official opposition and uh, just you know, um, noting that uh, putting speed limiters on, on, on trucks has been proven and shown to reduce at fault accidents and to also reduce emissions. Ontario introduced this in 2008, capping uh, speed limits at 105 kilometers an hour with fines anywhere between $250 and $20,000. Quebec introduced it a year later um, with uh, the same limit at 100 and, 
five kilometers an hour, but their fine structure is um, a much more narrow, $305 to $1,050. And uh, it appears that British Columbia is expecting a similar uh, 105 kilometer an hour uh, limit. Uh, I'm just going to uh, end with this. Uh, I think that it's incredibly important that we are creating uh, the space and creating the, uh, the legislative framework uh, and the classes of vehicles uh, for the future potential of self-driving vehicles. It feels like self-driving vehicles, uh, my colleague from uh, Surrey White Rock mentioned um, the, uh, the, the Back to the Future reference from 1989. I also remember uh, that movie, which uh, also dates me. Um, it seems like you know the, the self-driving car has always been just a couple of years away. It's just a couple of years away, and and now that we see this renaissance for um, AI happening, perhaps uh, we'll find that yes, indeed, self-driving vehicles, little pods that move us from A to B, maybe a subscription service. Uh, they go and you know park or go and pick somebody else up and and then uh, you know when you need to come back from the grocery store There's a pod there to, to take you back to where you need to be Perhaps we will um, we are just a, a few years away from that um, But it's it's clearly more than just uh, the vehicle that is going to be required uh, for that technology to be in place uh, certainly uh, very robust um, a uh, very robust network is going to need to be in place. Access to, um, uh, I think, the type of broadband capacity that we haven't even imagined yet. But we are working towards that. Certainly, the um, uh, certainly the developers are are ever working towards uh, making that a reality. And so it's good to see British Columbia um, creating the classes of vehicles and creating the framework for that to exist in. And finally, I think just a tip of the hat to Indro Robotics. Um, with the regulations that are coming in place uh, for emerging technologies like delivery robots, uh, there's, a, there's a few companies out there right now that are, that are using this technology already. Uh, I just saw a, and I can't remember the company's name, but I just saw a company in Africa delivering uh, blood uh, from a central uh, blood location out to hospitals uh, in more remote areas using um, using airplanes and parachutes. Um, deliveries going every 20 minutes, a really phenomenal system. And Indro Robotics, which is a company that I think started on Salt Spring Island, or at least has, a, has offices on Salt Spring Island. And uh, I think the first robotic, um, I think it's called line, out of line of sight delivery that has happened in this country happened on Salt Spring Island. Uh, in my riding, it happened uh, a, a pickup from the London Drugs in Cowichan and Duncan with a delivery uh, to, a, to a location on Salt Spring. And so that is also, uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful that the government is, is working to uh, regulate that area because uh, I know that there's innovators in my riding that, that are working on this technology and perhaps it will uh, limit the number of trips that I need to make uh, on my bike. So uh, with that, I just want to raise my hands and, and, and gratitude for uh, the changes that are being made here as someone who's going to be immediately and directly impacted by these laws, it will make my life safer. And I think I appreciate that, my family appreciates that, and, and people who uh, cycle uh, in this province and who are pedestrians in this province uh, will appreciate it as well. So with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you, member.